Women in politics face the most concentrated manifestation of sexism and prejudice in our society. Unlike, for example, corporate boards, the process of electing the leader of a political party by a nomination, one of the most important positions in a country's political scene, is patently opaque and in many cases appallingly undemocratic. Our solution is to mandate their representation at the very top. What is our model? Firstly, depending on what parliamentary system you adopt, campaigning for the head of a political party is only possible if you are a woman. Obviously, this doesn't mean we limit the ability of MPs to be represented by individuals of both genders. We think that, for example, in the West Minister system, heads of political parties have the power to A, select or deselect grassroots leaders, select or deselect MPs, or choose, for example, the cabinet. Party leaders often also become the prime minister if these parties win. And specifically, we are advocating that only women are allowed to nominate <coughs> positions. We're going to forward three arguments. Firstly, that women deserve this. Secondly, that there will be equal representation, a good outcome, and probably the most important one in this debate. And last of all, I'm going to prove why we improve party culture and in general party practices. So firstly, that women deserve this. We think that women have been systemically shut out of political parties and in particular access to the leadership of many of these parties. What are the reasons for this? Firstly, because parties are generally afraid that nominating a female leader will be unpopular, and the consequence of this is that they shy away from discussing the prospect that they can put a female leader out for nomination. But secondly, because methods of electing party leaders often rely on grassroots patronage and old boys networks. Like for example, how John Major rose to prominence in the Labour Party was not because of actual qualification, but because the networks he built up via working in the grassroots. Therefore, women are systemically denied access to political leadership and the ability to be nominated for many of these positions to begin with. In the many rare cases where women succeed, what they are often forced to do is also to adopt traditionally masculine characteristics and abandon what society thinks the ideal women ought to look like. For example, Angela Merkel and Margaret Thatcher explicitly had to deprioritize their families in order to be considered for nomination of the heads of the respective parties. We know this is a blatant violation of their ability to campaign and to access politics in the very first place. So we're going to afford two claims. First of all, that there's a right to fair access, and we think that the only way we can sufficiently guarantee this is to put a female head of a political party who can then nominate, for example, female MPs, or at least more open to the idea of nominating female MPs. But the second thing we forward is that we owe women reparative claims because of the huge social stigma that we have imposed upon them. Because policies, for example, a lack of abortion provisions in the past, have disproportionately affected them more than any other social group. As a consequence of this, we think that we owe them a moral obligation to provide fair access to politics and to invite them to political positions at the very top of these parties. Secondly, how does this tangibly lead to equal representation and why is this important? What do we mean by equal representation? Firstly, we think that obviously the inclination of many of these female heads of political parties will be that they want to appoint more women in their cabinet and, and as part of their, and a part of this um, party state of MPs. But moreover, even if they don't, we think that at least as a head of political parties, they're better able to represent the interests of women because only them with the lived experiences can sympathize with the struggles that women on the ground face and are more likely to pass legislation that is friendly towards women. What are the benefits of this? First of all, more representation of critical issues that are gender specific. Are we saying that men can't represent these issues? First of all, this Probably not true, like many men who advocate and support these issues. But the problem is how they prioritize the relative importance of these issues. We know women and only female heads of political parties, as well as politicians, are in a unique position to decide that these issues are very important because they have the same lived experiences as the people who will be affected by these policies. Like, for example, only you can understand, as a woman, why it means to have a pregnancy if you're considering abortion laws, for example. All male legislators are responsible for things like attacks on tampons in the European Union because they don't understand the struggles that many of these women face and that they've gone through or they explicitly deprioritize them. The second benefit that we think is quite important in a moment is also role modeling. Many young women can then look, for, look up to and can aspire to be part of politics when they see fe strong female leaders and the heads of your most important political parties. Yes? So if the barometer is the capacity to go through men's seats, does that mean you would exclude postmodern women or trans women? Okay, so, so, so clearly there are a number of issues that are only accessible to a smaller intersectional group of people with those lived experiences. However, on the comparative, we think that women have greater capacity to access many of these issues that are hidden from men. Also, many of these laws are explicitly gendered in a way that specifically excludes women and all of them from benefiting from all this legislation. We're also very happy to have like, affirmative action for trans individuals in parliament if you think that's very important. So, we think that men explicitly deprioritize these issues, having women allows for role modeling. And moreover, the positive impact of role modeling is that we increase female participation in grassroots work and party volunteering, which means that at a lower level, you have greater representation of female interests, because more individuals now believe that they have a tangible shot at getting elected or nominated into the heads of these political parties. So, somewhere in opposition, there's going to be the line that backlash will inevitably occur from conservative white males as a result of this policy. 
Firstly, we don't think that this tangibly is something that most people feel deeply affects their lives on a personal level. So the level of backlash is that to be limited. But also for political leaders, and often the functions that they have, and often the roles that they play in public discourse have an important signaling effect. So it normalizes the idea that a woman can potentially lead your country. And we can point to the track record of this as a form of precedent. Like for example, well thank you, um, um, we can point to a positive track record of female leaders who will now exist on our side as we use to justify why it is possible to have women in positions of power. The point is that in many countries, there is no such precedent, and therefore conservative groups will say any female prime minister is going to lead the country to ruin. At least provide the opportunity for these individuals to succeed on our side. Lastly, about party culture and how we positively change the internal practices of many of these political parties. The first claim we make is that we give parties a greater incentive to reach out to and develop more female participants. Currently, parties do not have such prevailing incentives. The reason being that they believe many of the women have minimal chances of going into positions of prominence within these political parties. What we do now is to make parties reach out more to women at a grassroots level and also invest in the training and the development of many of the fledgling female politicians who might be rising up within their ranks. We think that parties have a minimal incentive to do so now. This also has positive effects on women outside of these political parties, which parties then canvass to and will then make them, uh, and for example, parties will make them feel like the issues that they care about are important, that they are valued and they have a future in politics. Moreover, the second benefit within party culture is that we abandon the clientelistic networks that prevail and define many parties. Often these clientelistic networks prevail because of things like old boys clubs, because the core leadership of political party all attended the same boys' school in the UK and moved on to there become the head of the Conservative Party. The consequence of this is, of course, like a culture of masculinity where bosses ask us about it, out for drinks, stuff like that. And the only women who can succeed are women who buy into this culture and adopt these traditionally masculine characteristics. When we forcibly introduce women from the outside of these parties, where parties are forced to prioritize women in a manner that they otherwise would not have, we allow for more of these idealistic networks and networks of patronage to be broken in a manner that ultimately, even if the benefits of women are less important than this debate, ultimately result in an abandonment of many of the harmful practices engaged in by these political parties, like networks of patronage and old boys clubs that ossify politics and hold us back. We're very proud to stand in opening up. I think the Prime Minister can be very happy to call the leader of the opposition. Political leaders, the symbolic proxy leadership having as political parties are the masks of the mask of patriarchy of the day hides behind the oppressive women in the 21st century. We think pushing women into stereotypes of for some mysterious reason to be more peaceful and then be more capable of doing politics is equally demeaning and unconvincing as pushing them into, uh, as pushing them into stereotypes of as being less capable and to be go home and should go home as being housewives. What the government's government's problem is the is that even that they have like incorporating them and uh, this woman in parliamentary house should not be the end of this debate. Rather, I think they're still operating under the pre-existent power structure dominated by the male. We don't understand how they call it to the empowerment issue is being provided on their side of the house. What only uh, what only opposition stands in this debate are these. We think it's not only harms progresses of families and movements currently, secondly, we think toxic democracies as well. Let's be very clear, we are against the woman who using the shortcut and handbag of advantage to gain leadership, the dump are Indira Gandhi of India or Benazir of Pakistan. What we support are people like Alan, Sir, Alan Sirleaf Johnson of, uh, of Liberia to obtain the presidency by their own efforts and his own prior, prior, prior experience. What's your standing responses to, uh, uh, the, to also, the, also the first sentence of why we say hurt women in general? Because I think in general, appointed women leaders, political leaderships, are not able to push through the family's agenda at the very first place. The first reason is because they operate under the pretty distant structures of the political partisanship. That is, they have to prioritize their, par their political party identity, in, like prioritize its over its woman identity. That is to say, you don't act freely of passing whatever policies you think favor women, you still think favor favoring women at the very first place. But that only we think is oftentimes make yourself receive more criticism because if you do propose for your own agenda, oftentimes times people accuse you of being selfish for women. But more importantly, if you are just asked about general comprehensive social economic policies, you cannot say, I don't care, because people didn't want, expect to see comprehensive political leaders at the very first place. But finally, no thank you. 
that if you do have that so-called social signaling being sent better as more in fact we encourage more to participate in politics, we think we better have that. I'm going to case an examples of Adam, uh, Adam Sir Johnson of Liberia, those independent women political leaders that also uh, benefit on the side of the house. So more substantive. Why are we seeing this targeting women in general? The first thing is because that we think this representation or empowerment is proxy is illusory. Why do we think so? Because the very important thing to notice here is that women political leaders also have to share important traits of masculinity as well. That is to say, also have to regard as political strongmen and set reinforcing the idea that men like style is a correct style of doing politics. We think that's principally wrong and it's against the agenda at the very first place. But secondly, about how no, thank you. What's a background, or how does this women political leaders look like? Oftentimes, they have a lack of understanding of the intersectional issues as well as minor aggressions women encounter in daily life. No, thank you. The, the, it's because they come from elite, they come from an elite social class. They're better educated. They go to the Ivy League for colleges. That's why they don't do for legislation that benefits, let's say, low-income women or single mothers, etc., etc. The conclusion of this argument is this. That we think so that a lot of issues women encounter today is more of a social class issue or political class issue rather than simple gender issues. And by enclosing this entire symbolic in, uh, representation with elite women, only reinforces and may exacerbate those existence, this current existence issues. Thirdly, what kind of narrative is given? Right? Why we see the narrative they give rises to are very much negative because we think this appeals to both sides of the spectrum of people. On one hand, people think people uh, the women no longer need help because well, they are the presidents and they are the prime ministers. They are very much in power. It's very high, highly analogous to what happens to the narrative against African Americans when Barack Obama obtains the presidency of the of the of the Oval Office. But on the other hand, that people claim that this representation is a shortcut thing. It's an unhonorable achievement. That is why we think if their side of the house want to talk about, let's say, if inspirational stories or modeling, in fact, and encouraging women to participate in politics in the future, we think people like Alan Sirleaf of Liberian, also that Denmark Prime Minister who takes the presidency, uh, or Prime Minister presidency, uh, with, her pre pre with her previous experience of legislator, works better. The second, before I move on, I think you are closing here. Expecting women to portray masculine traits is a result of having competitors that are equally male. Yeah. Um, don't you think that this problem is neutralized the point at which all leaders are women? The problem, there are two premises to this response. The first thing is that obviously, not women behave absolutely feminine. Some of them do behave like men. But secondly, because of current power structures of the entire political party still chooses the woman they favor of, that is why they choose the woman highly analogous and most similar to men. The difference is that we have no empowerment or no change in social discourse, you have something like looks good but doesn't change anything within this party or within this political culture. The second thing why we think is toxic democracy is this. Because principally, we think people should be able to choose who they want, the, who, who they prefer as a representation of themselves. Because it's very important because that elective authority is that people need to stay consistent and in alignment with the policy crafted by this Years. The consequence of the notion are as following. The first thing is that people who is clear alternatives who are now shut off are going to be irritated and give rises to a focus, uh, focal point of popular resentment. That's precisely the, uh, the amenities that is to say, the, 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 that is to say that's a woman only list in UK parliamentary. You have to be a female to be a candidate in the first place. That drives people's at channeling people's anger because people think they're denied the opportunity to get into our parliamentary in the very first place. But the second part of this is again, we think it's largely and highly relevant to your social class issue. That is to say, the more limitation or the more constraints of eligibility of political candidates this, these things are subject to, the more likely that these people are prone to regard politics as a game of elites that's necessary just whoever don't understand the truth, whoever don't understand the game uh, game out. That is saying, when you literally have a woman representing your political party, people don't say that's from feminism groups. People still say Hillary is from Democrats. That is why whatever representation you have is a secondary product of the partisanship. And people think we don't regard this Hillary as a feed feminism as well. People think it's a proxy interest representation of the political party. That is why even in a general narrative, people think Hillary is a powerful female politician rather than the, rather than the feminism politician. We think this is largely anti-democratic uh, anti because we think that precisely when other told you can use this woman to leverage certain policies for women is particularly dangerous because people don't think this is a progress achieved by women. They think the progress of a compromise with the political parties that is half to made as a last choice and this woman actually has nothing to do with that. For all this regard, so what we brought you in this debate is very clear. We think firstly that oftentimes this woman doesn't come from this group. It doesn't give rise to the empathy or the correlation of or like 
all a relation of women find themselves related to these women, given their background, even their children by the pre-existing currently a uh, current male po power dynamic. Furthermore, we think that it talks to democracy as well because people are not able to get access to democratic opportunities. People have resentment towards leaders, and this party will fight, an organization will fight for women. We are very happy to oppose. Of opposition, and we're very happy to call Deputy Prime Minister. Yep. So, Walter makes two claims in the speech. Claim one is that this policy fulfills a reparative duty we have to women who have been structurally and implicitly cut out of politics. Claim two is that we change all boys' club cultures that adhere to political parties and we also better represent women's issues on the electoral agenda. Keep both these things in mind as I talk to you about three issues. One, on the right to fair access. Two, on better representing women's issues. And three, on backlash. One, on fairness. We are two reasons why we are all women representation. Reason one is that they are most proximate to the disadvantages which stem from a men's war. Historically, for example, women have had to bear the brunt of laws written by male legislators. For example, a ban of abortion written by male legislators in Northern Ireland. Second reason, the traits and opportunities afforded to women are a lot less than those afforded to men. I've told you about how parties are reticent to select female leaders, and this is because of things like clientelistic networks, established male leaders, etc. etc. That's why women have been forced into the invidious position of making themselves more masculine, of sacrificing their career in exchange for a chance of political success. Because fundamentally, they are operating in a men's world. There is this need to fit in into the overarching structures that were defined by their predecessors and those who are currently in power. So Arthur first made a reparative argument that had a female politician been born a man, she would have stood a better chance at running for political office. And given this moral arbitrariness, we need to how empowerment works. We don't just tell you to struggle on. We account for the fact that these historical injustices have occurred, and we owe women a duty for greater representation. But it also has a run on effect more than just leading a political party. It has a run on effect in the case of things like selection and deselection. Who gets to be a cabinet minister? Who gets to run for you in terms of grassroots campaigning? Who gets to run for you in terms of districting elections? And we think this is really important because women are more likely to select, for example, fellow women MPs who are in turn more likely to do things like prioritize issues higher up the legislative agenda as Arthur told you. And I think this segues nicely to my second area about better representing women's issues. And here's where I rebut everything that Elle told us. He told us that independent female leaders exist in the status quo, and our policy foments a degree of dependence and women who are not going to be good at championing these issues. We heard three things. One, women are going to be more masculine. Two, these women are going to be richer. And three, women are going to be better educated. Suggesting that class issues are more important than you know, women's and gender-based issues. I have four rebuttals. Rebuttal one is that the reason why this happens in the status quo is because for women to succeed in a men's role, they need to be exceptional in order to get over gender barriers to access. That is why you see Hillary Clinton, because she had to be bloody great in order for men to even consider her in the first place to run for things like senator. My next few rebuttals, I'm going to take down each one of the things that they told me. Okay, so the first thing they told me was masculinity. I argue that this comes down to party culture, as Arthur told you. It is implicit expectations created by male leaders that create glass meetings. So for example, if I were in charge of the Labour Party, I might say, let's go for a drink, let's go for a game of golf. But these are in, uh, implicit social signals and also trained barriers to entry that lots of women may not have access to. You may not feel comfortable in that space, for example. Or to talk about politics in a gentleman's club, to do things like engage in networking from a young age. So we think that masculinity is only an issue if men hold the implicit social levers to power and acceptance. The second thing that just how told me was this thing about wealth. Actually, I argue that it's an opening opposition that women leaders look like Ivanka Trump, Benazir Bhutto, and Aung San Suu Kyi. And the reason why it's worth on their side is because without our policy, the main instances where women rise to power are when they leverage the power of their own privileged status. That is why we see in the status quo, the most powerful women in developing countries tend also to be clientelistically related to former leaders. Benazir Bhutto's father was a former Pakistani prime minister. We all know who Aung San Suu Kyi's dad was. So it's actually in their role that the only instances of women's leaders are those who are less likely to be representing women's interests. The third thing that we heard from them is this idea about better education. And we think, first of all, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but secondly, especially when we look at the level of MP representation, that's when selection and deselection becomes absolutely crucial. Because it might be the case, especially in developing countries, that access to education is not equal, it's not equitable. 
And when you have women leaders in power who are more able to then you know, select cabinet members who might be similar to them, who might be able to select MPs who represent at the district level, who may not necessarily come from the best schools that are often gendered in nature, I think that's when you get more development. So these are four rebuttals to that case. I want to add on a fifth even if tier, that even if I'm wrong, and it's the case that we actually do produce more elite women, richer women, we still think that there is a unique, as Arthur told you, a unique epistemic benefit to being able to access women's issues in a way that have been pushed up the priority list as compared to other competing issues of the day. Things like, as he said, the tampon tax, the EU legislators, because they are majority men, did not necessarily think it was a terrible idea, but actually really hurts lots of women who have to pay a luxury tax on what is a daily necessity. And we think that these lived experiences serve as crucial markers as to what issues were high at the legislative agenda, what questions are asked at prime ministers' questions, etc., etc. These things are really important. So, five responses to that case. Okay, last area on backlash. And I know what is going to come up to say. It's going to come up to say that there's a tension in our case. It's going to say that we can't on one hand claim that it is hard for women to get into power, and on the other hand claim that these issues will go away as a consequence of our policy because we create backlash. So we come on one hand claim that these problems are severe, and on the other hand claim that women find it hard. This is nonsense. And the reason why this is nonsense is because the problem Arthur identified is that parties in the status quo tend to be more conservative than society at large, especially when it comes to established political parties that are extremely fearful of winning and losing a political election. That is to say, parties themselves construct an approximate conception of society that then determines who they select to lead them. But before I go on, yes? Will you allow independent candidates to Like, yeah, I mean, but they have to be women. So I, I would allow that. But at, at this very important point I'm making, right? The argument here is that often, society is the front runner as compared to a political party. Political parties are actually responding to social changes when you actually see more women in charge. So what we are arguing is that we need to reverse this transmission mechanism. We need to have parties having the incentive, or in this case, being forced to appoint women in positions of power and therefore have them presented to the public and influencing the legislative agenda in a way that leads to substantive change. So I don't think that this backlash argument is particularly strong. But even if you are swayed, maybe in closing, that the backlash argument is strong, here's a further thing to consider. I think the degree to which being able to represent women's issues or being able to run for parliament is matters a lot to you, right, as a member of a class that significantly has been disadvantaged. As compared to somebody, a man on the street, looking at the people on the you know, ballot paper. And I think that the signaling effect of seeing only women leaders on a ballot paper isn't that great. When people are deciding who they want to lead the country or who they want to vote for, very often local issues predominate over national ones. Then it's say I care more about my local MP as opposed to the national election. For all these reasons, I'm incredibly proud to you propose. So we think that if this reparative critique exists, then it exists to all women because all women have been disadvantaged by the historical status quo. So we think the burden they need to meet, we don't think they have met, maybe closing will, is whether or not this policy actually benefits all women as a whole. Whether they are, you know, women who have poor women, and trans women, and non-binary women, whether they have to be women in the developed world, the developing world, rich or poor women. Second, they said they will get rid of all boys' networks like who will concede these in. Okay? So it would be the case they will have prime ministers for all boys' school unless they are trans women under their policy. Maybe they weren't clear how they were standing it up with regards to people who had intersexual issues of that point. However, we also note that it's kind of naive to assume that Hillary Clinton was not advantaged by networks. They will not be all boys' networks, they will be networks. And the problem with that, as you know how gave you, but didn't necessarily really get much response is one, those networks are capable of manipulation, more on that later. But second, it's going to be the case that they'll be perceived as manipulative, even when, in the best case scenario, they are not. One other bit of rubble that doesn't fit in, local elections, at best, that's manipulatory, at worst, it's entirely irrelevant to things like presidential campaigns. I have no idea why that was there. There won't be another response to it. So what? Does it substantially benefit the representation of women? Second, the right to choose and the inevitable backlash argument. And third, does this actually benefit or harm the passage of women who act within society? First then, so they said, well, look, we, uh, there are gender barriers and we can see these obviously exist. In the developing world, we think these are reasonably adequately dealt with by two things. One, an increasing awareness and understanding of those issues and an attempt by women and other people to fight against those barriers, to challenge those kind of narratives that exist in the society. We're going to point 
points and examples where that has happened really well when we were discussing vintage Korean narratives, as we gave you in our speech, and did really get lots of points. Second, though, we think that institutions like Emily Press can exist in order to try and adjust those barriers. We think that's beneficial. We don't think that is necessarily meant by the same kind of backlash because people still see those being a fair contest just merely more resources being given to women at the early stage of the process. And we think on the whole that tends to be something that people are much more likely to accept and much more willing to accept as being still fair representation. They were still a fair shot between different candidates, so you don't necessarily get the harms we think their case accrues. When they, you benefit, uh, what benefits women we think more in a representative sense, which is to say people concerned about you know, female role models are challenging the kind of gender norms in society, is when women have been able to push those barriers and you have that kind of integrated narrative associated with them. We gave the example of Ellen Johnson Sully, who became president of Liberia after this deposition of Charles Taylor, in part because of her rep reputation and record as a civil rights advocate in Liberia under the Taylor administration. A second, perhaps more prosaic example, might be like one that's familiar to most people in this room, the Julia Gillard case, where she was able to push back and inspire women across the world with a response to the ditch, the, 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 the witch uh, attacks from the other side. We think even though she was subsequently defeated in the election, that was still an important moment for women in the developed world and indeed the developing world as well. So we think that you rob people of those military narratives on your side because now you're perceived as someone that's only there by virtue of the fact that there's a system being rigged in the favor of your gender. Like, they say that it's only because of male competition that this happens. I think there's a more interesting response we're going to get to this later. This is the clear way we get from closing. But we think that if you look at someone like Lord Mayor, it's fairly clear that A, like you're not operating this policy in a vacuum, right? There's still going to be male domination of corporations and other institutions. Most notably in a large number of countries, male domination of the army, right? The reason that, uh, that people at Lord Mayor play into those tropes of you know, masculinity is primarily because they're seen as commander in chief, right? So it has to be seen as someone who's capable of leading the IDF and you know, leading troops and these kind of things. So we think that a lot of that degree of generalization wouldn't necessarily change on their side. All they do is adjust the way in which it is perceived. They say they get rid of networks. Look, the networks will still be beneficial, but more importantly, they still have this weird contention they get. This means there's more women in cabinets. Let's think about what a cabinet minister is to me. A cabinet minister, to me, if I'm a prime minister, is a rival. There will be possibly no other women in the cabinet, because those are people that might be able to depose me, or alternatively there's going to be one or two. Who are these people going to be? There's going to be people like Angela and Lisa. There's going to be people who are being groomed as natural successors to the sitting prime minister in the case she ends up being defenestrated, right? That means that there's a massive network advantage to those individuals, and essentially we have a system where party leaders can pick their successor in most cases because they can shut other people out from positions of power under which they might be able to challenge that. That harms inter-party democracy, but more importantly it actually strengthens the extent to which there is a stranglehold of traditional elites within party parties over the system, no thing. Second then, the right to choose. So we do think this is an important democratic principle, we do think lots of people accept this principle as being important, which is a problem on their side. But let's note a secondary problem with this. Right? In most of these cases, especially given what we've just said about the extent to which people can manipulate the system in order to ensure their successors, there's a, a feeling that there's an alternative rival candidate. Right? If you look at people like Tony Benn during the period where he wasn't the leader of the Labour Party, but lots of people thought he should have been, or Enoch Powell after the Rivers of Blood speech, or perhaps an alternative example might be Bernie Sanders, which might, might be more more contemporary, where people said, well, you would have been the candidate if they hadn't rigged the game in favor of Hillary. There's a large tendency for this to be able to undermine a lot of the things the leader is doing. And this will be gendered by cause of the, the way the system is being rigged in favor. So even if you believe this is up, like, which they have no reason to justify, right? They've been perfect mechanisms for being able to manipulate it. But even if you believe that the rules are being perfectly uh, uh, perfectly like run in a totally fair way, there's no way to guarantee that other people will see it as that case, they will see it as the least man uh, manipulating system, exactly as happened with the new uh, women-only shortlist in the Labour Party, which meant with considerable backlash from people within this constituency, the claim that they could just hand away backlash is pretty naive. Second, let's consider what this backlash looks like in countries that maybe aren't likely to have things like evidence. Let's consider, for example, Hasidic Jews. If you cannot touch a woman, you are unlikely to vote for a woman to be prime minister. Like, it physically pains me to defend religious elders on this side. But however, let's consider countries like Nigeria. Like, you think it is going to be a destabilizing influence if it is going to be that there is a large number of people who believe Western education is for round, who are next only have to vote for someone to be pre president. They're probably going to not vote. They're more likely to join a militia. I would like to take closing. I'll take it. So you argue that cabinet's multiple ways. A talented female politician can threaten to run for office if she is deselected from cabinet. Well, that might be the case, but most people are unwilling. Like, if this is a UK system. Most people are unwilling to work for someone who has had experience in high office. Secondly, it's quite likely there will be someone who's been put there as the natural successor, as Theresa May is literally doing with Andrew Leeson, right? That's why she's there as a leadership debate in her place, right? This often happens with elites, but the thing that you do is you create a system that more or less guarantees 
Finally, does this actually benefit women's issues? So they said all women menstruate, this is a red line they have in common with them to bind them together as one sister. Like, obviously, obviously not, right? One, that's factually untrue, but second, like, the trouble is that you get a deprioritization of women's issues because for reasons we've already explored, you haven't really had that much response to. You want to deprioritize those issues because you don't want to be seen as just a woman. Those only think they have a great response to this because they say, well, that happens as a result of the competitive of dynamic when you have men running against women. Aha. That competitive example dynamic works in our favor. On our side of the house, abortion was legalized in the UK by a man, but opposed by a woman, which is to say Margaret Thatcher. Not necessarily the most feminine of prime ministers, but nonetheless someone who was opposed to the legalization of abortion at the time it was passed under Harold Wilson as a result of the program of by a man. On their side, that doesn't happen, but more importantly, during the competitive dynamic, female candidates are likely to try and prioritize their womanhood more than anything else, and are more likely to prioritize those issues. They don't get that prioritization on their side, they get deprioritization, especially the issues that affect most the poorest women in society, we don't think they're never proud of women, we're very proud of women. liberation in society is not exactly which formal legislative policies are passed by whoever happens to be in the halls of power. It is how people see women, the way that they perceive of them as necessarily less dominant, authority, rational, and more overly emotional than men. I think it is embarrassing that this debate has focused entirely on who sits in the halls of power and not how the vast majority of women, whose lives are not as affected by whether or not there is a tampon tax as they are the levels of domestic violence and aggression and the fact they cannot be employed at the equal rates of men are. This debate is about the way that politics shapes society, not about the laws that are passed. And at closing government, we're going to bring this debate into the real world. Two points of rebuttal before I move on to our extension. Firstly, just to add to this opening half clash as to why this policy is necessary in order to get female leaders and therefore the opening opposition can't just say they'll look for organic leaders who get there uh, by their own merit. Under the status quo, there is a clear collective action problem where obviously female leaders are in many cases beneficial in, in, for the country, but often in many ways for the party themselves. But the reason that parties can't elect, the, can't pre-select those leaders necessarily is because those leaders are seen as less competitive, they are seen as less legitimate, and they are seen as less electable. That means that even though it might be good for the system overall to elect those leaders, the first move of disadvantage of having a woman up for election against a man means you are much more likely to lose, and therefore no party does that. We think it's odd that opening opposition ocean gives us the example of Julia Gillard, who lost a leadership coup by Kevin Rudd after Tony Abbott stood next to science calling her a bitch and a witch, and that probably meant that the Australian Labour Party is unlikely to put a female candidate forward for the next few elections. The unelectability of women is a comparative issue, and therefore removing that comparative disadvantage and making all leaders female is the only way to get those leaders in positions of power. The next thing I want to talk about is what we hear from opening opposition, which is that we prefer women who reach, reach those positions out of merit because it avoids the idea that these women don't deserve those positions and it avoids resentment and back backlash. We would just like to question what the actual impact or concretization of that backlash or resentment is in a system where you cannot exert it by therefore voting for a man. Like, it seems like that is quite an abstract harm in this debate, and given we're going to show that we advance the position of women more generally in society, that is clearly less important. So let's move on to this extension. The very existence of female political leaders, regardless of their policy impact, regardless of the impact of like opening up the halls of power, is the biggest benefit in this debate. Because I think at the conclusion of the opening half so far, the proven impact of what policy gets passed, or like how open democratic networks are, is pretty marginal. We agree with our opening half, you open them up somewhat, and women probably care a little bit more about things like the tampon tax. But what we're going to tell you at closing government is that the barbs of misogyny, which have the greatest impact and cut the deepest in women's lives are not the literal legal protections and
enacted or the formal discrimination which exists, but it's the operation of gendered power dynamics in spite of formal legal equality, and therefore that is the most important thing to target in this debate. Because most countries have anti-discrimination law, but women are still much less likely to be hired for managerial positions. In all countries, it is illegal to assault someone, but women are still beaten at criminally disproportionate rates to men. This is not a question of what laws are on the books, it is a question of how those laws are enacted and obeyed, and that is something which means we need to change society more broadly. Note that this clearly is more important than the benefits of the opening half, because the benefit of those laws existing is that they affect people's lives, where proven we have a greater impact on people's lives. So the question then is how do we change the way that women are treated by, by men in society writ large, and, we, and under which side we are more, not under which side we're more likely to repeal the tax on tampons. Let's note, this does take up opening opposition's challenge of prioritising the least privileged women, because we're not talking about how we get rich, well-educated women into positions of power, we're talking about how poorer and more disadvantaged women who are more likely to experience that discrimination and violence are treated in society more broadly. Let's also note that opening government only dealt with the way that we might normalise women being seen as political leaders, we are clearly extending beyond that to broader social impacts. Because who sits in those political offices is not a question of this debate. So what then does this policy do? The mechanism of closing government is actually quite simple. We put women in the highest political offices in the land. You see them shake hands with state leaders. You see them sign bills into law. You see them sit in parliament in kind of the most important chair. And then let's note clearly that this extends beyond our norm of what we conceive of women doing in politics of the norms that we break down about women more broadly. So how does this work? Because the norm shifting power of challenging stereotypes in this debate is absolutely revolutionary. Because the most insidious misogyny in society today is not blatant hatred of women, it's not people having the views of Jordan Peterson in round four, it's people of all genders who just think that women should be respected and should have equality, but it's less appropriate for women to be aggressive because that's bitchy, whereas men can do it and be assertive. Thinking that women are less able to negotiate because they're less rational and they're more likely to empathise too much with the other parties, they can't get a good trade deal. It seems like thinking they would be, just a moment, just, oh sorry, I'll take closing in a second, they would be distracted by their emotions and that sort of thing. Let's note that those norms of preferential masculinity extend beyond politics to many other areas of society, where women are less likely to be promoted into managerial roles because of those same norms of not being able to prioritise, for example, like the budget of a company and, they're, and instead empathising with having to fire employees. Those sorts of norms exist everywhere in society, but politics is a uniquely powerful way to change those norms. And I'll take, I guess, what it Okay, so Thatcher, Golda Meir, the Rwanda policy that has 50% of the legislature women, all these societies still have gendered violence at approximately the same rates as before. How does your policy address any of these issues? Look, good luck winning this debate with counterexamples rather than actual analysis. What we've told you is the way that these positions of power change norms is to, in, to normalise women existing in those spaces. Why? Because socialised beliefs and stereotypes are created by perceptions and taught by experiences, and therefore the way to challenge those things is to present clear counterexamples. It is to innate, it is to disenable people from maintaining those biases rationally. And yes, you'll still have some blatant sexes, but you'll get the vast number the majority of people in society who like to think that they are feminists, but still hold the hell those views that women cannot be in those positions or do those things. Because you literally see them negotiating those trade deals, you literally see them being rational and prioritizing the interests of the country over all of those counter, um, all of those other issues that I spoke about previously. And opening opposition's analysis actually helps us here, where they say you have to be seen as capable of leading a military. And sure, you might have some skepticism at the start, but then you will see competence enacted and you will therefore challenge those implicit biases of thinking that women cannot be aggressive and that women cannot make those kinds of tough choices. Because what this policy does is weaponizing the, it weaponizes the legitimizing power of high political office, a traditionally gendered and masculine sphere, to legitimize women holding those norms. And the impact of that is all of what I've said previously. It's employees being more likely to think that women can be rational and to disassociate their emotions. It's things like putting them on corporate boards. It's things like men being less condescending to women and, and thinking that their masculinity is less challenged when women assert themselves, which is one of the key causes of domestic violence. We need to make it clear that women can have those characteristics by having a big fucking counterexample sitting in the highest office in the land. This isn't about whether or not we've appealed the tax on tampons, it's whether or not women treat women men treat women with dignity and we achieve that. Government member, very much. I'm very happy to call the member well.
just the other side of the house today, forgot the most important context to which women exist and where they are most oppressed. This is developing countries where we have two main characteristics. The first is that they have the highest levels of oppression and the highest levels of the traces of the patriarchy. And secondly, the majority of the women of the world live in these areas. And that is why it is the most important question of whether or not the society is able to deal with the developing countries. But the second thing we have to note here is that a lot of developing countries around the world have very, very weak state institutions. That is to say, majority, a lot of people in the society care more about following gangs in Latin America, like in Mexico, like favelas being run by gang lords, or in places like the South Asia, where you have a lot of militia groups running the government that exists today. We would suggest reinforcing the narrative that the state is incompetent and run by the elites or makes it far less likely for the state to exist in these regions and will lead to worse outcomes for women to begin with. We would suggest also that a lot of the assumptions coming from the government bench is that the state will be able to enact the policies that it necessarily wants to enact, we suggest it's very unlikely to do so. My response to the closing government extension about how we shift arms will be integrated at the end of my constructive. So, we suggest that we do make states weaker. Why are states, or these developing countries, the government that exists right now, weak? We suggest two reasons. The first is because the state is perceived to be incompetent and handling their economy, the state is perceived to be corrupt, the state is perceived to be unable to promote police and ordinary society, but secondly because the state is supposedly perceived to be run by the elite members of society. First, on incompetence. We suggest that the patriarchal will believe that women are incompetent will continue to exist in society today, that they can't run the military, they can't run the economy because they should stay at home. We suggest that even if Closing government extension is to believe, we believe, that they'll be able to change it in the long run. Right now, the current perception is that they are incompetent. This just doubles, no thank you, the notion that the state is incompetent and reinforces that notion that the state is incompetent. It's obviously not able to fix policy, but now you have women running the heads of government that exist in society today. But the second thing you have to note here is that a lot of times the state right now is perceived to be elite. But in developing countries particularly, for you to be able to get women to have the basic qualifications to be a political candidate, like being educated and being put in like some relative qualifications, you need to be like a doctor of the oligarchs of the existing society to have a foreign education to go abroad. We would suggest that you probably are also part of the elite members of society that the vast majority of the developing world, the people of the developing world, hey, no thank you. Which means that the trust in the very state institutions start to diminish, the trust in the ability of the government to lead starts to diminish as well. That is why, even if we believe government's characterization that we have more influence in the state, we suggest the state becomes weaker. No thank you. Why is problematic? First, even if we believe that you will have control of the parliament and you will have control of the executive, a lot of times there are non-democratic state institutions within developing countries that will take your rule away from you. For instance, you have things like the military, no thank you, which is highly sexist, and they still perceive you, no thank you, to be incompetent. And a lot of times, they do things like entering to coups. That's why when Cory Aquino was put into office, independent of whether or not she was elected, because she was replaced the vacuum of like Ferdinand Marcos, what happened in the rest of the house, we had six coups trying to stop Cory Aquino from being put in power in the Philippines. We would suggest that it's very unlikely to be able to hold on to that power, the point at which you as an individual in society are able to keep yourself. But secondly, even if we believe that you have control over the government, we would suggest that the capacity of the government to affect change and control order society, i.e. places with gangs and militias, is far less. And a lot of times it's problematic because you see these gangs and militias that are comparatively even more sexist against the state. One makes them no democratic checks, they're usually led by military men, they're usually led by the men of society, commit all the atrocities of sexual violence that exist today, we suggest you give them more control of the rest of the house when you weaken the state. But secondly, even to the extent of not gangs, right, the fact that the state is less able to get taxpayers' money because people don't believe in the state and don't want to pay taxes, less able to develop their economy because you don't have the buy and hold on corporations, means that your ability as a state starts to weaken, which means that you probably have, a little, have increases in things like poverty, you'll probably have increases in things like crime, which we would suggest disproportionately affect women today because they're the ones forced to stay at home, they're the ones who stay forced to take the double burden of caring for the child and caring for the individuals in their side of the house. We would suggest that you make it far worse when you make the state incompetent, the form of on opening. If you think that people's beliefs about women in these countries are so unchangeable, do you oppose in general women just acquiring positions of power in developing countries? No, no, no. So I think 
the comparative here is that, that women will not be able to get into positions of power. But we suggest that that change should happen organically because forcing that change will necessarily work. And I'll prove that there are trends to allow that organic change to exist. So now I want to compare, right? Let's assume that you have good legislature that helps women under your side. We suggest that the reach of that legislature diminishes with a lot of times when you have control of the territories that you want. But secondly, the ability for you to enforce that legislature also diminishes when you have a weaker Fine. state. So we would suggest that the comparative under your set houses, more people are put in the worst possible scenarios that exist. We would suggest that the people who are covered in the state, probably the metro centers or the city areas, are probably a little bit more privileged than the people in the rural areas where this policy will probably take place. No, thank you. So now we compare, right? What is the counter model coming from opposition? We suggest that yes, we won't be able to fix the state over time. But it is easier to fix the state than it is to fix these other institutions that exist today. We have things like international sanctions, for instance, to make them fix the legislature. That's how you abolish a lot of FGM that happened in the sub-Saharan region. That's how you abolish things like in the Middle East, by pressuring other more liberal states, pressuring these individual states to change the kinds of policies that you necessarily have. So we would suggest it's easier to do that compared to your set house where you have no real mechanism to change these smaller communities. The next thing I want to note then is they claim that they'll be able to shift the norms of society by providing examples for women to be put in positions of power. The problem with this is that it assumes that the women who will be put in positions of power will succeed. Because if they fail, then they will also be blamed for the reasons of the failure and proves the fact that women are incompetent and shouldn't be put in positions of power and office. We would suggest that the argument we provided in extension proves why they are very likely to fail because their state is incompetent, state is far more likely to be weak under their house. They don't get the narrative. But yes, we will concede that there are some instances where they're able to succeed, but we have to recognize that even in the worst, best case where they do succeed, they don't really get any change because people will just say, oh, it's because they were forced in their affirmative action. So the marginal benefit of being able to change the narrative is minimal compared to the risk of them failing in the vast majority of cases around the world. We have to recognize that this debate is not only about the Western and liberal democracies most sides want to focus on, but about where women are the most vulnerable, and that's the developing world. We're very proud of the post. The opposition member, and you're very happy to call the government. I hate to break it to CEO that the problem they have is not necessarily because a woman was in power, but rather because corruption was prevalent in many of the countries that they were name dropping, right? Those would have happened regardless if you got individuals who are holding positions of power and corrupting the nation being put in those positions of power regardless, not necessarily because they had a problem with the gender that was representative of the people. In my speech, I'm going to talk about two things. Number one, does this actually regress the feminist plight? Number two, what is the reaction of people on the ground which then directly also then deals with closing opposition's material? First thing, does this regress the feminist plight? Opening opposition tells us that um, if this is very likely to regress the feminist plight because women are expected to give in and be masculine despite being a woman, and since no woman is 100% feminine, this just seems like a bad idea. I think this may be true to the extent that there is no woman, or presumably, I don't know, like femininity, like there is no such thing as a woman that's 100% feminine, but I think this ignores the spectrum of mix between masculinity and femininity in a woman is still comparatively less as opposed to what we conceive a man to be. That's why, like, it just makes no sense for you to say there is no difference because when you reject that, you're essentially rejecting the existence of gender roles and expectations of genders within society, which quite frankly, I don't think is a good idea in this debate. But secondly, even if at the beginning, these women are like somewhat coerced to become more masculine as to what they otherwise would have been if they didn't enter politics, I think the culture changes over time. When the conversation regarding politics and everyday expectations, as, in, as mentioned by Steph, changes with the fact that people take cues when more and more women are given positions of leadership within these political parties and that how that shifts people's perception towards women's capacity to take on leadership roles and when people attribute the respect that women have in political activism as well as political parties and then attribute that to personal because usually what's political is personal like I think in those scenarios individuals are very
very likely to have more respect for women, therefore women feel less pressure overall in future in the long run. We have to constantly get in towards those masculine traits, especially when other political parties are also made out of other leaders who are women as well. So we don't necessarily think we don't necessarily think this actually regresses um the feminist plight. And quite frankly, I'm not sure of what the alternative is in, in, op in opening opposition's world because they've given you literally no mechanisms on how it is that political parties would have a natural inclination to create organic change to make the political sphere much more female friendly so that women, guys, sh sh have more room in order for uh, women to be both completely feminist while holding on to those positions of power. Because if you can't give us a model on how you would ensure women can actually have equal opportunity to access positions of power, that's unfeminist. Two, uh, second question, what is the reaction of people on the ground? They said that people won't respect a female leader because they don't recognize her as her own being and she's merely a mule of the political party. Several responses. Number one, this ignores the characterizations attached to being a leader of a political party because not, like, notice that the entire opposition bench literally gives you zero characterization on what it means to become a leader of a political party regardless of what your gender is. This means that when we give women, only women, the position of being a political party, it doesn't negate the fact that she like won't still have all the responsibilities attached towards being a leader of a political party, right? Clearly she is also the most competent woman that the political party sees because the political party still wants the best candidate to run against other political parties, so they will choose a woman who clearly has exhibited skills and capacity to engage in things like being able to go for political campaigns, answer tough questions, fight for policies and not shy away from debates, establish strong networks with other powerful people in society regardless of what industry they come from. Just like the sheer position of being a leader in a political party means that it gives the woman visibility as her own despite also being a representation of that political party. Therefore, it is not as simple to brush it off and say that she is a mere mule of that political party. Secondly, having women in positions of activism as how opening opposition wants, uh, like, says they would like women to have, sure, gives women some like street cred, right? But couple that with our policy means that people are more normalized and exposed to the idea of recognizing women aren't just mules to the cause that they carry, but are also a strong figure within those causes that they carry. So it's unclear why it is that your manner of getting respect when it comes to getting women in positions of leadership when it comes to civil activism is mutually exclusive where we're also talking about positions of leadership within political activism as a representation of the political party. Thirdly, no thank you, people have to start respecting these women and can't just simply brush them off and say they're unimportant because the woman is the face of the party, which means that if you have an interest and given the fact that people still want to engage in democracies, it's her ass you have to kiss whether you like it or not, right? This means that if you're within the upper class with capital to lobby, you still have to establish networks with her, even if you're unfeministic at, in the first instance. If you are self-interested enough, you are very likely to still engage with that woman, and people on the ground later then also take cues as well towards needing to respect these women, even if they're rather two-faced about it. But at, in the end, they can internalize that respect the same way as how people still end up internalizing respect towards men because of the past trends that have been exhibited when men hold positions. Power. No. Fourthly, you as an average person, like if you don't like that women there, given the fact that many other political parties are also choosing women as their, as their leaders of political party, like what are you gonna do? Not vote? It makes absolutely no sense, given the fact that unfortunately the average man also has a tendency of wanting to be annoyed all because of the like trend of also mansplaining, which is unfortunately an unfortunate reality. Hold on. Um, I think just by the sheer need to want to constantly engage, show that you're participating, means that they won't just disengage from democracy just because a woman is there. Yes. So your normative shift requires perceived legitimacy. We don't think that happens if you appear on TV surrounded by male cabinet ministers, but when things go badly, people say, I wish they hadn't rigged it against Barony. We don't think you get your norm shift at all. I think we do, right? Given the fact that it's not just all seeing it tokenistically on TV, but knowing that this woman is the face of that like policy that she's forwarding as well, and given the fact that, like, I think the political party also wants to show that their candidate is the stronger candidate in comparison to the competing candidate from the other political party. So they're not just going to simply like frame her in such a way where she is a tokenistic representation of that political party. So what then happens in our world? We think that we change conversations on the ground because what's most important is that we change the sort of narrative, not just within the political sphere, but as well as the social sphere, right? The social sphere. Because I think that when people in status quo have to internalize sexism, 
not want to stand for positions of leadership in politics as well as other industries because they think there is no policy. When our policy does that, it becomes a cue for other people to take on those chances and want to fight and become leaders and not have to internalize those sexism. And then I think at the end of the day, when people start taking cues from that and when politics as like everything else in our lives starts, um, what is the word? Starts, starts, starts pushing you in a direction to want to have the same sentiment in other aspects of your life. Socially speaking, you become what you already. Thank you. Thank you very much. And to summarize the opposition bench debate as a whole and the preliminary round. And we have to call the opposition back up. one response, which is the intro, which was it would have happened to just corrupt at the state, because the state was just corrupt. Actually, the very premise of their extension, which is that a lot of women are seen as incapable of aggression, incapable of being competent, of being strong, like a strong man who most of these developing states support and would galvanize under, is precisely the reason as to why our extension is still alive. Because it's not the case that all these sort of like lack of support that have happened just because they say it was corrupt. No, there are multiple other factors outside from that which leads to why these politicians which we prefer in these places do come to power. So it's just really weird they were so flippant about that. That's an extremely important point to consider in this debate. Before I get to like any more responses, I just want to clarify one thing on extension. Look, this is the most important extension here. Because what we're pretty much saying is it's better to have a strong state, even if it's somewhat sexist, when the magnitude of all their arguments, oh, their all their consequences, so thank you, are pretty much just things like, well, we can have like maybe some things like the uh, better end of, of, of policies that crack down the domestic abuse. That's like, the best example coming from like closing. And then of course you have the napkins attack on something from like opening. Here's the thing. All the things that we talked about, about people dying, I think are more important than you actually having any of those. And many women will support this in these countries who consent to those. They have to grapple with it. I want to start with the, the first issue of my speech, which is basically like, to what extent really is the benefit of their access to women? Because this is like the bulk of their, you know, their case, right? First, I think like they assume that we don't really access like women, uh, important issues that help women. That's just untrue. And we would agree, yes, opening up might not have provided the analysis. They just gave the example that you know abortion is like legalized by a man. I mean, it's like bought, pushed forward by a man. But here's a simple analysis coming from closing up. One, sure, lived experiences are important, but it is also true that men access lived experiences that inform them to care about women. Precisely the fact that they have, they know relatives, they know wives, they have friends who are women, and they empathize with their pain. And even if they don't empathize with their pain, they feel the guilt, whether it be even this in the worst conservative state because of their religion, that, that drives them to support the kinds of things that they want, i.e., crack down on domestic rape abuse. I know with you, but a lot of countries actually yeah, pass laws cracking down on domestic abuse, even though like you don't have like all women leaders in those areas. I think it's quite weird that's why this is the only way to access women's issues. But furthermore, Let's compare this with what you can actually access coming from the developing context, coming to our side. No thanks. What you cannot access, however, is the support of the people, precisely only to like, and the trust of these people to the state, because you only, you have betrayed their trust because you created this policy they do not subscribe to, or you think that you should only allow women to exist there. That is something that leads to all the harms we talked about. And at this point in the debate, they have not mitigated that, but I think we've mitigated why all their harm, all their, all their benefits actually can actually still exist on their side. But I'll give you one more mitigation. A lot of the time, even in their world, because they gave the example of America, Gulf states, you actually have politicians who are women who will be, by the definition, anti-women. Think of, for example, like how, even in South Korea, right, conservatives do use a lot of like feminists 
fake feminists, I mean Christina Hoff Summers, or whatnot, or they could like point to, let's say, their wives, if they're like a Republican senator or something, and say they're gonna be that sexist, and these people, these women are actually are, 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 are like, you know, like part of their, 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 their platform. Now what's important, this shows that in their world, you could easily have a female politician, one of these people I described, who is gonna advocate against abortion. Because what they miss is it's a it's, it's lady friend to assume that just because you're, you're a woman, you will be pro-women by your definition. A lot of women have like intersections in their identity. They are religious, for example. They have conservative friends. They care about the community more and whatnot. And all these things are self they take into account. Sure. The gender of leaders is unlikely to be the primary determinant of fledgling state success, given the levels of unrest you described. Also, are you really basing your entire case on states without functional democracy when the debate of you told you not to do that? Okay, it's only like a non-functional democracy. These are still like sort of democracies, but there are sexists in there. But that would probably pose a, an opposite question. On the other side, if you think about it, if we can't talk about all these democracies, and we're only talking about states which are the opposite, like have like barely any sexism, and there's like pretty much like a very marginal benefit coming from their side anyways. But I think it's a real problem, like these still take in like sort of like a majority like states actually look like this. But furthermore, I think like what they have to grapple with as well is it's not again just like like you know like the gender, but if you understand that. If they actually attribute so many stereotypes and sort of like live experiences as well, that really inform them as to why they have to vote for that man. Like it's not just simply because they saw a woman, right? I think like that's really like quite lit. But let's talk about um, more stuff about like sexism and why we actually can fix all this stuff as well. First of all, I think like another thing that they miss in this debate is the simple idea that in our world. If you actually have a world where you actually subs uh, uh, another extension, like, like like prioritize the idea that you must have this ability to state, that leads to more transitions into organic change for actually more kinds of like flexible kinds of like uh, support for women. Now here's why I think this is likely and why this is better. Number one, and here's I'll integrate some responses to their colleagues well in this last part of the speech, right? Look. A lot of like the, the kinds of, of like the characteristics you confirm about, about how women are bad will exist on the their side as well. It's not true that because you see more women all the time, then you will always assume that every woman is capable. But the moment some women fail, what's like likely actually is when a lot of men will use this as an opportunity to demonize women and look at their flaws, you focus more attention and more spectacles to the failures of women. That increases as well. Now the key here is this. On your side, right, if you lead into organic change, when some people might still be modern enough and could actually change their minds, that still exists. But in their world, because of this forced kind of policy, it's hard to even attribute anything to women. It seems as though it was just something forced upon them. And that is something we can stand for. There's no conclusion of this. I think at this point in this debate then, it's a very dubious benefit that all of these women are actually really going to like, you know, like, like send a message to everyone that they should just all be liberal now. But I think that what we can keep in this debate though are things that for sure, you do lose out on an important like mechanism to allow safety that protects a lot of people in the developing countries, and you don't and you miss out on any kind of possible change you might have. Because simply, right, even in a simple sense, if you see a man speak about a woman, that still happens on our side. You can see actually that this might convince them. They're actually willing to listen to that man. But you don't even have that in your in their world. They just assume that you are going to change. We're very proud of you folks.